hello again to those of you who follow our press briefing live on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you very much for joining us today, the WHO European press briefing on the COVID-19 situation in the WHO European region. It's Thursday, 1st of July. I'm Luba Negro, and I'm part of the uh, WHO Europe's press briefing team today, and we'll be helping with the moderation. We have an hour for the briefing, and we'll start with a short statement, as usual, and we'll leave a lot of space to your questions today. Um, there will be one questions, and if needed, a follow-up on the first round, and then we'll go for a second round of questions, if time allows. In our expert panel today, we have, as always, Dr. Hans Kluge, WHO Regional Director for Europe. Thank you, Dr. Kluge. We have Dr. Catherine Smallwood, COVID-19 Incident Manager in the WHO Health Emergencies Program. Thank you, Dr. Smallwood. And online, Dr. Oleg Benish, Technical Officer for Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization at WHO Europe. Thank you, Dr. Benish, for joining us today. Without more delay, Dr. Kluge, you have the floor for the opening statement. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. A 10-week decline in number of COVID-19 cases in the 53 countries in the WHO European region has come to an end. Last week, the number of cases rose by 10%, driven by increased mixing, travel, gatherings, and easing of social restrictions. This is taking place in the context of a rapidly evolving situation. A new variant of concern, the Delta variant, and in a region where despite tremendous efforts by member states, millions remain unvaccinated. Delta overtakes Alpha very quickly through multiple and repeated introductions and is already translating into increased hospitalizations and deaths. By August, the WHO European region will be Delta dominant. But by August, the region will not be fully vaccinated. 63% of people are still waiting for their first jab. And in August, the WHO European region will still be mostly restriction-free with increasing travels and gatherings. The three conditions for a new wave of excess hospitalizations and deaths before the autumn are therefore in place. New variants, deficit in vaccine uptake, increased social mixing. And there will be a new wave in the WHO European region unless we remain disciplined and even more so when there is much less rules in place to follow. And unless we all take the vaccine without hesitation when it is overturned. Vaccines are effective against the Delta variant. Not one dose, but two doses. Delays in getting vaccinated cost lives and economies. And the slower we vaccinate, the more variants will emerge. We see many countries doing well, but the truth is that the average vaccine coverage in the region is 24% only. And more serious, half of our elders and 40% of our healthcare workers are still unprotected. That is unacceptable. And that is far from the recommended 80% coverage of the adult population. With these figures, nowhere is the pandemic over. And it would be very wrong for anyone citizen and policymakers, to assume that it is. Today, I am not here to call shower any Euro 2020 fan or anyone's holidays. But before we watch our players and before we all pack and go for some well-deserved rest near home or far away, it is my imperative to give three messages. First, if you decide to travel and gather, Assess the risks carefully and do it safely, keeping all life-saving reflexes of masks and self-protections, especially indoor and in crowds. Second, take the jab. Don't think twice, take it, for you and for the others. And third, 
bring the vaccines to our most vulnerable ones first. COVID-19's trajectory in the coming weeks and months, whether we are to see a resurgence, whether schools are able to open their doors for our children, depends on the decisions and actions of us as individuals, communities and as governments we will take now and the weeks ahead. The stakes are still high, but let us remember, solidarity pays off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kluge. Uh, dear colleagues, dear journalists, the uh, text of the statement uh, will be posted on our website in about an hour or so. But if you need it urgently, please contact our press team in the email listed in the media invite. So now let me open the floor for the questions. And um, first, of course, I would like to thank those journalists who provided, who sent, their, who shared their questions in advance in writing. And I will start by them. Um, First question comes from Taz Ali from the I paper in the based in London. Taz would like to know: Should we expect further lockdowns in Europe, and is there likely to be an autumn winter winter surge? Um, I have to say that one of the most uh, frequently asked questions uh, by the media, and I'm looking at Dr. Kluge. Dr. Kluge, can you please start answering? And then if Dr. Smallwood would like to add anything on that. Thank you, Tas Ali. As I was mentioning in the statement, the vaccination coverage in the pan-European region is still not sufficient to protect us from a new resurgence. And remember that we have been there a year ago. So we really should learn the lessons. Of course, we are much further because we see that vaccines are working. They prevent particularly hospitalizations and deaths and in the vulnerable groups. But as I was mentioning, after two months of decreasing cases, now for the first time, we saw an increase in new cases of 10% during the last week, which not surprisingly is driven by increased mixing after societies are opening up and also the increased transmissibility of the Delta variant. So I would say the window of opportunity to act is now and it depends really on our actions as individuals and communities. To put it simply, more transmission, more variants. Less transmission, less variants. Thank you. Dr. Smallwood, anything to add? I'd just like to add that in addition to what the regional director just said, um, the, the real question will be, what is the public health impact of a surge in cases? And that's where vaccination really comes in key here, especially in the context of Delta variant. If we have large groups of populations that have not had two doses of COVID-19 vaccine, the increase in cases that we're already seeing in several countries across the region will be resulting and will coincide with increasing hospitalizations and increasing deaths. So the concern, as we've been saying for months now, of an autumn resurgence is still there. But what we're seeing now is that it might even come before the autumn. Okay. Um, dear panelists, actually, if you allow me, I'll make an exception. I'll just take a second question from Taz, because it also seems to be one of the most frequently asked. Uh, she wants to know, does the WHO believe holidays in Europe are safe with the use of COVID passport, or should holidays be avoided altogether? And I would like to stress that Taz is asking about Europe, not WHO European region, so probably focused on that part of our region. So I will uh, answer again uh, first uh, Taz Ali and then hand over to, to, to Katie. We do understand, of course, that people are tired of uh, restrictions. This has been and still is a long uh, period to, uh, to adhere to the restrictions. In fact, WHO with partners launched a summer communication campaign, Summer Sense, that if you decide or think to travel, really think very carefully. And then if you decide to do it, do it safely. Be your own risk manager and take the precautions. As we say, the three W's, wear the masks, wash your hands and watch the distance and avoid the three C's, the settings that are closed 
confined and crowded. And as Katie was mentioning, let's all together work to scale up the vaccination. So if it's your turn, take the first jab. Still 63% of the people in the larger region are waiting for the first jab. And then if you got the first one, like uh, I did two days ago, take the second one immediately when you're called upon. Dr. Smallwood, yes, please. Just to take this a little bit further, I think at the individual level, um, we all need to ask ourselves, what's the risk to myself? Um, who am I? What underlying health conditions might I have? Have I had my full course of vaccination? Where am I going? What's the epidemiology in the location where I'm going? What's my access to health services? Should I become ill? Um, what am I going to be doing? Am I going to be frequenting areas that are crowded? Um, or am I going um, somewhere where I'm living um, in a small group and not coming into contact with other people and hiking in the mountains, which is a much lower risk? And also, what are the requirements that are going to be um, uh, asked of me while I'm traveling? How am I getting there? What are the risks during travel? And what will I have to do when I come back home in terms of um, either testing or quarantine? So all of these need to be taken into account. Sorry, Mike. Um, the next question is from Birgit uh, Grigo from WDR in Germany. Uh, Birgit is asking, do we need more sequencing to stop the pandemic and why? Dr. Kluge, do you want to take this question? Birgit, so more transmission, more variants and uh, vice versa. So, of course, WHO has been monitoring and measuring variants of concern since the start of the pandemic. And there are many, many, and I think it's important to time to time to remember that most variants are not of concern. But absolutely, it is very important to beef up sequencing and study the effect on transmissibility, severity, and vaccine efficacy, so that we still better understand what does it mean really for the uh, for the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Birgit, um, just to acknowledge that we still keep you two questions on the list. If we manage to answer this during the briefing, okay. If not, then we'll get in touch with you in writing. The next question is from Kostas Davanis from ERT in Greece. Kostas' question is, vaccinations continues in the EU having reached 360 million doses. However, there are citizens who either out of fear of side effects or ideology are not vaccinated. Could you explain to us what the epidemiological situation in Europe would have been if vaccines had not been discovered and distributed so quickly? Thank you, Kostas, for this very good question. Uh, Dr. Kluge, can you start, please? Yes. Efharistopoli, Kostas. So... Very straightforward here, vaccines save lives. And I really appreciate your question because we should not forget that there are several silver linings in this difficult time. One of it is that 18 months down the pandemic, there is a portfolio, quite a robust portfolio of vaccines which are working, which previously would take five to 10 years. In the European Union, there is also the joint procurement without which several countries, not at least the smaller countries, would have been left behind as well. And now we see that this, uh, is, this uh, rollout is really scaling up. But I'm looking obviously at a pan-European perspective. And that's why it's very important to remember the pan-European solidarity and that the EU can never be safe without other countries not being safe, be it the Balkan, the Eastern Partnership countries, and for this, I would like to express appreciation to the countries which are donating and or reselling vaccines, particularly still to countries where not all healthcare workers and the elderly people have been vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, and we have Dr. Benish online. Dr. Benish, can you please just give us a sign if you want to add anything to this answer? Uh, 
Okay, go ahead. Yes, Luba. Uh, I think that what uh, has already been mentioned uh, by regional director um, uh, in the introductory words is that we still have an unfinished agenda in terms of uh, vaccination. First, by reaching to those who need the vaccines most to, uh, to prevent hospitalization, to prevent deaths, to prevent serious disease. And therefore, it's really uh, uh, important to uh, have uh, a broader perspective uh, beyond uh, the situation in a group of countries. And we really need to uh, think about uh, 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 reaching those who are most vulnerable. And from this perspective, the solidarity is a key and uh, countries uh, uh, w w acting jointly and also uh, uh, supporting each other uh, is really crucial. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Smallwood. Yes, yeah, just go ahead. just to add that many countries have already um, announced preliminary um, figures for deaths averted, and that's the real measure that we're looking at in terms of the impact of the vaccination rollout so far. Um, here at the WHO um, European region, we're also conducting uh, a preliminary analysis using. Uh, a standard procedure that we use for influenza um, to measure the impact of influenza vaccines to do a pan-European analysis of the deaths averted and we'll be ready to share those results as soon as that as, as we, we have finalized them. Okay, we have two, yeah, let me just take two more questions. Uh, uh, sent in advance and then we go online. Just bear with me. One question is from uh, Camille Bavoller uh, from Agence France Presse Global. Uh, Camille would like to ask the following questions. Cases are increasing in London, Baku and St. Petersburg where games are set to be played. How safe it is for 30,000 up to 60,000 football fans to gather in one arena in those cities? To what extent does the uh, tournament prevent us to keep the virus under control? Yes, thank you very much, Camille. C uh, Dr. Smallwood, can you please take that question? Thank you, Luba. And we've been raising um, awareness and, and um, key messaging around large mass gatherings. What we know is that in a context of increasing transmission, large mass gatherings can act as amplifiers in terms of transmission within the wider um, communities. And it's really important that there's a continuous public health risk assessment that's implemented by local authorities and the public health authorities around those mass gatherings. At the moment, of course, we have a large, major sporting tournament. High visibility is placed on that. We're seeing a lot of images, um, and there's a lot of images within the stadia. We need to look much beyond just the stadia themselves. What we need to look at is around the stadia, how are people getting there? Are they traveling in large, crowded convoys of buses? Are they taking individual measures when they're doing that? What's happening after the games when people leave the stadiums? Are they going into crowded bars and pubs to watch the matches? And we've said that should these things, this mixing happen, there will be cases. Because if this mixing is happening, among people who are not uh, fully vaccinated, and there is the presence of the virus, there will be cases. And we've seen recent announcements, um, particularly from our colleagues in Scotland, with an, ex an exceptional analysis of the cases that, um, that they've detected in, 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 in association with the football games. But this is not unexpected. And these types of events are happening all around the region, all around the world, in much smaller, less visible uh, instances. And it's these small introductions, these continuous events that are happening that are driving the spread of the of the virus. So um, we need to look a little bit broader than the stadia themselves. Thank you very much, Dr. Smallwood. I, actually, uh, it would be good to hear Dr. Kluge's opinion. And, and actually, the next question 
will give this opportunity. Actually, we have it from Riccardo Bagnato from Radio Televisione Svizzera. Uh, and Riccardo is asking a very close question. He's asking, holding European Championships uh, semifinals and finals in London, are, according to many epidemiologists, may be a major, might be a major risk for the Delta variant diffusing in the UK and Europe. Do you share this opinion, Dr. Kluge? It's very much in line with the previous question indeed and uh, uh, Katie's uh, reply. So yes, of course, we are definitely uh, concerned. We, we know the Delta variant is documented, reported by a total of 33 countries out of the 53 in our WHO European region, including host countries of the UEFA Euro 2020. And as uh, we heard from, uh, from Katie, from Dr. Smallwood, that in some host cities, where the matches will and are being held as well. So it comes back to the same piece of advice, really, that this has to be, really, the risk has to be very well assessed and people have to do it safely, taking care of the individual behavior, as we were telling, watching of the distance, wearing the masks, washing the hands, and really the health system to be further strengthened in the wake of the Delta variant with testing, increased testing, contact tracing, uh, isolation and genomic sequencing, which we have been telling since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's good news that we know what can be done, but we're still not out of the woods. Thank you to both of you. And now we move on with the questions uh, raised online. I see Tom uh, um, Magner from Carriers World Life. Tom, can you hear us? Please unmute your mic. I can, Liuba, and thank you very much. It's good to be on this uh, press conference again. Uh, Dr. Kluger, our unpaid care of viewers will be heartened, certainly, by your advice earlier on. But the UK press and politicians no longer speak of shielding, yet many people remain vulnerable despite double vaccination. The majority of these unpaid carers work to support their families, yet are being forced back to the office. The UK government is intent on lifting all restrictions, come what may, and it appears that the wider UK population is ill-disciplined. What should the vulnerable do in the face of all this, and can employers work sympathetically with unpaid carers? Thank you. As you may know, Tom, I have been establishing eight months ago the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, chaired by Professor Mario Monti, to rethink policy priorities in the light of pandemics. We also have people from the UK, as uh, Professor Martin McKee, Professor Mosialos, Jim uh, O'Neill. And one of the recommendations coming forward is really on the health workforce, including the unpaid workers, the informal carers as well and this is definitely a point of attention in our policies on what needs to be done Tom sometimes I call it VIP approach the V from variants genomic sequencing strength in the system the I from immunization and this is the best thing to do we used to tell that the vaccine is a tool in the toolbox to get to a sustained transmission but now it has become really the tool and then the P from the people. That's why in the office here we established since a while the Behavioral Insights Unit to help countries with understanding what drives people to make a healthy or unhealthy decision and then to design specific interventions for specific layers of the population rather than blaming them. And the last P of the VIP approach you uh, are hinting to is the big P of politics. And we have been advocating all along that political decisions have to be driven by science, public health and epidemiological data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kluge. Uh, next, Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie? Can you unmute yourself? Thank, thank you, Luba, and thank you, uh, Dr. Puga, Kluge, and Dr. Smallwood. Nice to see you all again. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions. The first is, um, it sort of echoes what has been said already, but um, your three points about things that need to, to be done um, lead me to believe that, um, that, that 
that's more of a of a call for the public to to respond more than governments. And I'd like I love it if you could. You know, we see countries like France that are reopening. We see Turkey that's encouraging people to visit for 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 um, for for tourism and whatnot. So, what is your message directly to governments? Should they be doing more? Um, you know, because you do mention um, you know the easing of social restrictions. Should they be holding back on that? And then the second question, very quickly, is. What do you say to people who wonder whether European countries should be sharing doses um, of vaccine when a new wave could be looming? How do countries strike the right balance on that? Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, I will start and then give to, uh, uh, to Katie. So the message to the governments is, first and foremost, to look from a pan-European perspective. We need coherence in policy. That's very important. And this goes from COVID-19 uh, certificates to testing policies at the points of entry in countries. So that has been improving a lot, but coherence in policy is very important. And the second thing links to your second point is on the pan-European solidarity for uh, vaccination. So this is indeed being studied also about uh, the booster and uh, whether it is needed for vulnerable people uh, first and then the larger population. But I would say, let's work first on the 64% of the population in the pan-European region who has not received a single dose. Then if you look towards inside the country, for the governments, it is to respect science. That's my main message. We need to restore the trust in science because we know what needs to be done. I also know that decisions have to be based on pragmatism that we can no longer have uh, very long, uh, complete uh, lockdowns and leaving the, the people alone. But we know enough now to extinguish the fires locally. So a strong surveillance system and act very fast on uh, localized uh, outbreaks, which will be there for quite uh, a time to come. Dr. Smallwood. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah, please, please thank, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to add to, to the regional director, we've spoken many times about windows of opportunity, and I think we have one again in front of us. Um, many countries in the European region are still seeing very low incidence at the moment. That's a really good thing. Some countries are not. Some countries are seeing the highest death rates um, on a daily basis that they've seen during the whole pandemic. And that's really due to the rapid resurgence um, that is associated with the spread of, of the Delta variant. So there are six things I think that, that we really need to be clear about for um, our member states and for governments. One is don't lift social measures in a context of increasing transmission. If you do lift social measures at all, make sure that that's complemented by reinforcing the public health measures that are in place. What does that mean? It means expanding sequencing, sharing sequencing data, using it for public health action, sharing, it, sharing knowledge on new variants as it, as it happens with WHO and with other countries so that collectively we can improve our responses. It means continue to invest in testing. Don't let that run by the wayside just because cases may be lower than they were before. Remove any barriers to testing, especially financial barriers to testing. Expand incentives for people to quarantine and isolate if they need to. This is really important. And use the moment of low incidence to really strengthen your contact tracing and your case investigation. Countries like Scotland that have just announced really rapid analyses of where people are getting infected and where infections are spreading show a, rapid, uh, a significant control over their health information. That enables them to take strategic, targeted and swift action. And finally, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate if you have the vaccine. If you have the vaccine, reach out, get to all of those priority groups, because that will mean that even if there is a surge in cases, that your most at-risk groups will be spared from hospitalization and death. Uh, thank you to both of you. Jimmy, I see your hands is still up. Do you need a clarification? Or oh, that's okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, then we have Ricardo Bagnato. Ricardo, I'm sorry, but uh, we've got your questions in writing first. Uh, we are actually half an hour, 
um, uh, from the end, so we we can go back to you in the next round of questions. So I take the next one, Gerardo D'Amico from Morai News 24 Italy. Gerardo, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would like to know if uh, the Green Pass uh, could be could become a danger by favoring a greater spread of infection uh, um, if not done with uh, two doses uh, and uh, uh, if it uh, uh, includes vac vaccines not uh, recognized, recognized by the EMA. And uh, more, uh, uh, I would like to know uh, your judge uh, um, about the decision to have uh, uh, football matches uh, played in the city with a high number of infection. Okay, thank you very much, Gerardo. Uh, Dr. Smallwood? Thank you for the question, Gerardo. I think um, by the Green Pass, you mean the um, European Union's um, COVID-19 certificate um, that is bringing data together for individuals around testing status, immunity status um, from previous infection, and also vaccination status. Um, this doesn't change what people are required to do um, as they travel internationally between countries in the European region. Uh, however, it does bring together the information and allows it to be put into a single application where uh, countries still make their own decisions in terms of uh, restrictions from specific countries um, or requirements on entry into their countries. So it brings together information. In terms of um, the football matches, uh, of course, as the regional director, and, and, and I've said in the past, we are, of course, worried about large gatherings of people, especially if they're um, in settings where the virus is spreading quickly. Uh, this is a public health concern, and we encourage uh, member states, uh, local authorities, organizers of these events to take all measures needed to reduce the level of risk. There is no zero risk. There will always be a latent risk associated with these types of events. WHO has um, published a tool uh, recently uh, specifically for the UEFA Euro 2020 matches that provides information both on uh, the stadia, the capacities, the measures that are in place at the local level, but also at the very local municipal level, the uh, infection uh, data that we have that's available publicly. And it enables organisers, the public, to look into where the matches are occurring, and to understand the trans transmission dynamics and to use that information in their own risk assessments. So we encourage people to use that as much as possible. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the next... Excuse me, and about uh, the um, football, football match uh, uh, in the city with a high number of infection. Thank you. Anything to clarify? I, I think I spoke about that at the beginning of my response, that uh, in where cases are rising, risk assessments and mitigation measures need to be in place um, in those settings to avoid people from transmitting the virus. And in my previous answers to other questions, I think uh, what needs to be highlighted is that there's not an exclusive focus on the stadium itself, that it's a broader assessment that needs to take into account uh, the measures and the restrictions and the public health uh, response in the community, in uh, in the host venues, um, much more broadly than just the stadia. Okay, thank you very much. I hope this clarifies. And the next on the list is Emin Aliyev. Uh, I mean, I guess you couldn't put your full name in the Zoom ID, so I'm reading it from the chat that you posted to us. Emin Ali from a Report News Agency in Baku, Azerbaijan. Emin, go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Emin. Uh, yes, um, we can hear you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Kluge. Good afternoon, dear experts. Uh, thank you for having me. My question is about the about my country. As uh, the our neighbors, Georgia and Russia, have recently reported that uh, they have been uh, uh, recording the cases of Delta and Delta Plus strains of uh, COVID nineteen. 
So my question is uh, about the uh, risks of uh, spread of the Delta and uh, Delta Plus in the South Caucasus region. And as you know, the how, how do you assess the risks of uh, the spread of these strains in this in, the, in in our region? And as you know, the uh, Azerbaijan, our country, is has been uh, uh, vaccinating uh, population against COVID nineteen. Uh, do you think that the uh, vaccination can help prevent the spread of uh, these two strains, Delta and Delta Plus, in our country? And uh, with, do you think that with, with a full vaccination of population, uh, will, will we need a, a, a complete uh, closure of the co uh, lockdown of the country again if uh, the uh, these strains uh, reach the region, reach our country? Okay, thank you very much, Emin. Uh, Dr. Smallwood, can you start? Yes, I can start, and maybe my colleague Oleg would like to, to say something about vaccination uptake in, in Azerbaijan. In terms of um, the, the risk of spread or the likelihood of spread of Delta um, into the South Caucasus, um, we would currently state that as very high likelihood. Uh, what we're seeing is rapid replacement um, of other variants by Delta uh, across the region, um, in Western European countries, um, in Russia, in several countries in Central Europe, and we're likely to see that occurring also in Central Asia, but also in the South Caucasus. So that is likely to be very high, and countries should be preparing for that right now. Uh, in Azerbaijan, there's been a very uh, solid response um, to surges in the past, and that needs to be continued. So despite vaccination continuing or starting to, to occur with, with um, uptake increasing, there will remain large population groups, especially of people who are at risk of severe COVID-19, that will be those that are especially at risk as the Delta variant spreads. And it's really um, increasing vaccination uptake in those priority groups um, that is a key action here, but also the ability for Azerbaijan to take rapid, swift action to any increases in COVID-19 transmission, especially um, right now as incidence is relatively low compared to earlier this year. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Benish online, can you add anything on vaccines in Azerbaijan? Probably a couple of important messages. If yes, please connect. Can I, can I just add before, before Oleg that sure. I, I forgot to say that um, it's really important that uh, with the data that we have right now for the Delta virus, that people complete their vaccination course. We have good evidence now on two vaccine products that there's a, a drop in efficacy after a single dose or a drop in effectiveness after a single dose. But the change after two doses of the vaccine is much less significant. So two doses of the vaccine will offer very similar levels of protection, but one dose will, will have um, a drop in efficacy. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thank Benish? You. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to highlight is that uh, 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 indeed, in Azerbaijan, we see a very strong commitment from the national authorities to support immunization. And at this stage, uh, more than 20% of uh, population already has received uh, uh, first dose, uh, which is an important achievement as uh, compared to other uh, middle income countries. Uh, and also we saw the efforts of the government to bring various products uh, uh, and to offer uh, citizens uh, a choice to be vaccinated. Uh, with that said, uh, we also uh, have some concerns. First, uh, uh, to reach those uh, uh, who need uh, it at most uh, uh, to, to get the vaccines. And when we look at vaccination coverage in elderly groups, uh, in, in those who uh, would really benefit uh, most from vaccination, we see that there is a lot of room for, uh, for further uh, improvement. Second, we also noted some uh, concerns uh, uh, amongst population related to use of specific products. So some vaccines might be in more demand, others in less demand. 
And from this perspective, the message from WHO is that all the products which have been uh, authorized by WHO are safe and effective. Uh, uh, and this needs to be uh, communicated to, to, to everyone so that we don't have a situation when vaccines stay in the fridge and people remain unprotected. Vaccines will work really if they uh, are, are administered, if they are given uh, to people. And it's really very important that we support people uh, with uh, data, information, to, to, to make them uh, uh, um, fully uh, uh, confident on, on the importance and need of, of vaccination. Unfortunately, we still have these concerns uh, across various countries uh, uh, in the region, and we see some slowdown uh, uh, in, in coverage, in particular with some vaccines. So those are areas for, for further joint efforts, and uh, uh, we would be glad to, to, to work together on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Benesch. Um, now is it Nikolai Skudsgård from Reuters. Nikolai, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well, go ahead. Good. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Dr. Kluge, are you concerned that the Euro Soccer Championships risk actually becoming or being a super spreader event? Uh, there's been reports of soccer fans bringing home vi the virus from, from matches abroad. Uh, and also in the UK, a lot of Scottish fan fans uh, brought home um, the virus after a trip to London. And secondly, uh, today is the launch of the new travel certificate. Uh, to put it directly, do you think people should be going on holiday in other countries in Europe? Thanks. Yes, Dr. Kluge, go ahead. The most popular questions. Thank you, uh, Nikolai. I will kick start and then uh, uh, ask Katie to, to compliment. On the first question, I hope not Nikolai, but this cannot be excluded on the reason that you were mentioning. So hence, again, this risk assessment to be taken very, very seriously, particularly with the, the knowledge we have now on the increased transmissibility of the Delta variant and the Delta Plus. Having said that, it's not only the UEFA 2020. I mean, there are many other mass gatherings as well, like uh, music festivals and uh, uh, other ones, or, or smaller ones. So it comes back to... The summer sense, the common sense, we're not out of the woods. We need, uh, we know what needs to be done. First and foremost, everyone to take the two jabs. So this is number one. And then on the, the second one, certainly everyone needs to rethink the purpose of the travel. We know that travel leads to increased mixing, interactions, larger gatherings so it is inherent a risk that is being taken of course this risk can be minimized again if people are vaccinated twice but then what we have to be careful Nikolai is that in a situation that still half of the healthcare workers are not vaccinated that we will take away from a pan-european perspective vaccines for the people who are most exposed over heroes which we should continue to applaud from younger populations who go on a pure touristic uh, business trip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kluge. Uh, we move on with Ricardo Bagnato. Ricardo, thank you very much for... Um, sorry, I'm looking at Dr. Smallwood. I think she wanted to add something. Please go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Smallwood. No, 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 sorry. no problem. I just wanted to, to add um, on the examples that, that you cited about... Um, cases being detected associated with um, the uh, UEFA Euro 2020. Um, th these are, this is expected. This is what um, we have been speaking about for several weeks and months. Um, and the main message here is that the um, public health systems need to be primed to be able to respond quickly if there are cases emerging from any mass gathering. And they need to be aware of those risks and they need to be able to identify them and take rapid action. And yes, we have seen um, the, the Scotland announcements yesterday. They're taking rapid action. We've seen cases among uh, Finnish uh, football fans returning in quite significant numbers with high positivity rates. 
And these are things that have been picked up by national authorities and local authorities, and they're responding to them quickly. We need all of the host venues to be doing the same thing. And we need public health systems across the region to be looking at all gatherings that are occurring, whether they're small household gatherings, whether they're large mass gatherings, and be primed to know how to detect super spreading events where they happen. Very important messages. Uh, Ricardo Bagnato, thank you, Ricardo, for your patience. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Ricardo? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much to everybody for this uh, meeting. Very shortly and fast. Many epidemiologists at Dr. Smallwood have been underlying the fact that mass gatherings like semifinals and final in a country where Delta variant cases are increasing and the population has been through a major vaccination process yet not completed is the right environment let's call it the perfect storm for the virus to develop new variants resistant to actual vaccines would you share this worry if yes could you elaborate more and again you said the name of the vaccines is a little bit weak with one dose is by any chance astrazeneca and you you can understand why I asked that. Thanks for the question. Let me respond. Um, we're not um, exclusively concerned about Delta variant. Of course, it's a concern because it has higher transmissibility. It's present not only in one or two countries across the region. It's present in a majority of the countries across the region. And it's doubling on a weekly basis in many of those countries. So it's spreading quickly. The main concern is increasing transmission of COVID-19, regardless of the variant. This is where we need to be extremely careful. When it comes to um, uh, the mass gatherings that are occurring, they should be risk assessed. There needs to be a strong involvement of public health authorities in those risk assessments and all actions to mitigate the level of risk within the gatherings, outside of the gatherings, um, and in associated events that might be happening need to take place. In terms of vaccine effect effectiveness for, um, uh, for the Delta variant, we have really strong and robust evidence on two vaccines. We don't have uh, much more evidence from other vaccines. The vaccines that we have evidence uh, for are the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. The changes or the effectiveness is similar in both. Both vaccines show a drop in effectiveness after one dose and a catch up after two doses. Both AstraZeneca and Pfizer provide excellent protection against Delta virus after two doses and provide extremely good protection against hospitalization even after one dose. Thank you. Uh, and I think we are done with uh, questions online and we still have 10 minutes to go. So I'll turn back to the list of questions uh, submitted in advance. Um, Birgit Griego from WDR in Germany. Actually, she has one question on Delta virus. I think we've kind of, we've covered that a little bit, but maybe just to stress a few me me messages. How dangerous and infectious is the Delta virus? And what do you suppose? When will we see other mutations? Can they be even more infectious? Dr. Smallwood, can you please advise? Thanks for that. And, and it made me realize I didn't respond fully to the previous question. So new variants will occur for sure. New variants of, a, of concern will also occur as long as the, the virus is transmitting in a widespread nature um, among, among the human population. This is the basic principle of survival of the fittest. It's basic evolutionary biology. Um, there are certain some certainties in this context. What we have is our countermeasures against that. We need to stop transmission or slow transmission as much as possible. Um, and slow down that process of evolution. So yes, new variants may occur, and they will occur mostly in unvaccinated populations where the virus is transmitting um, rapidly between people. In terms of Delta virus, um, there are three components to consider. One is transmissibility. It's very clear that um, Delta is the most transmissible of the variants of concern that have been detected and identified and characterized to date. 
In terms of immune escape, we do have some concerns around uh, loss of effectiveness after a single dose of vaccine. We're still learning from other vaccines, but we have good, robust data on two, uh, on two vaccines to date. The main message here is that two vaccinations are really critical to prevent infection. Thirdly, in terms of disease severity in people who are not vaccinated, there is preliminary evidence that there may be an increased risk of hospitalization with the Delta virus. So all of this means that, yes, we ha have a lot to worry about. We need to take the same measures that we've taken for all SARS-CoV-2 variants. Nothing really changes in the mode of transmission, but we're still learning, and we need member states to be sharing with us all of the data, the studies, and the um, new knowledge generated in the context of a variant that's rapidly spreading so that we can really use this and leverage this information and knowledge to provide recommendations to member states. Thank you, Dr. Smallwood. Um, Kostas Davanis from ERT uh, Greece. Two questions from him, both on Delta, but actually I'll, uh, I'll combine them in one and probably split it between the two panelists we have here. The one is for Dr. Smallwood, I guess. Can you give us more information about Delta Plus variant? and how is different from Delta variant? That's one, and the second part of the question probably for Dr. Kluge, if you don't mind, what should traveling citizens for their holiday um, and host countries look out for in order to avoid the risk of new wave of pandemic because of the Delta variant, Delta variant specifically? Uh, who wants to start? Dr. Kluge, do you want to start? Yes, so whether Delta or not Delta, the principle remains the same, but the efforts have to be doubled because of the increased transmissibility and a little bit of a breakthrough after a first dose of vaccination. It comes back to the same principles, responsibilizing the people and at the same time the governments to prepare their public health systems to be able to pick up any outbreaks of the Delta variant and really to try to contain it as soon as possible, which also means on points of uh, entry, the, to put the necessary public health measures in place, taking into account the situation of origin from where the travel is coming. So, a word of double caution, uh, I would say here. Thank you. Yes, and just to address the um, the question around Delta Plus, uh, for WHO, um, we've characterized the um, B16172 sublineage as the uh, Delta variant of concern. And what people are calling Delta Plus is, in fact, um, the Delta virus uh, with uh, an additional mutation. Um, which we would still consider, consider to be the Delta virus. Um, there's, in fact, a couple of additional mutations that are appearing. That's also normal um, with the evolution of the virus. Uh, but for, for the purposes of public health at the moment, um, we don't consider that necessarily to be dis dissociated from Delta. The, the measures are the same. Um, we should be taking every action uh, we can, whether it's Delta virus um, or with any additional mutations. Um, we still need to take the same action. Okay, uh, very quickly, we have uh, five, six minutes to go. Tom, I can see you online, but just taking a final question from Ricardo Bagnato from uh, Radio Televisione Suizera. Did you check the UEFA slash UK safety protocols? See links before, Ricardo said, shared the link for the event. Is it enough to avoid the risk? And he's talking about the European Championship, of course. Katie, can you... Uh, yes, thank you for that. Um, WHO provided our risk assessment tools to UEFA, um, who worked with the member states and the local organising committees to undertake risk assessments. WHO did not have any direct involvement and was not consulted specifically on those. Good. Tom Magna, Caris World Life. Tom... Go ahead. Thank you again, Liu. But just to follow up to my first question, um, I just wonder whether the WHO has got any specific advice for people 
who medically can't take the vaccine. I, I think I'm not a medical person, but I, I think they're often referred to as people having immunosuppressed systems. Um, be grateful for some clarification and advice. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Benish, can you please take uh, the question? Uh, thank you for this uh, question. There are uh, currently very few contraindications for uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccines. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, contraindications are product-specific. And there is uh, a flexibility here on uh, how to uh, address a particular situation in a particular uh, uh, patient. So uh, with the current vaccines, uh, uh, most of the people uh, um, uh, uh, would be eligible uh, to, to, to receive vaccine and to be vaccinated. Um, in a case of, uh, for example, of an anaphylactic reaction, so it's a very severe allergic reaction, then uh, a vaccination cannot be continued uh, 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 for a person. And in that case, uh, um, non-medical uh, uh, interventions uh, remain a, a priority for uh, for uh, getting protected from uh, uh, from infection, unless we reach very high coverage and we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, community protection uh, uh, against the disease. Thank you, Dr. Benish. I think we are now done, and that concludes our today's briefing. Thank you, everybody, for participating. We will be sharing the video of Dr. Kluge's statement and the briefing in an hour online in about an hour. If you need additional follow-up, please don't hesitate to contact us by email at any time. And uh, I have to, I want to mention that this is the last press briefing that we'll be holding for several weeks, so I wish you all a healthy summer and see you again in August. Stay healthy and goodbye.